uh, Bitcoiners forever have been saying, not your keys, not your coin. And they say, get your Bitcoin off the exchanges. So, I mean, the, the essential thing that you want to do after you acquire Bitcoin is to store it in a safe place. Now, that safe place uh, isn't, isn't always a hardware wallet. It, it might be an organization like uh, Fidelity that's a custodian that you trust or some cold storage or some institutional grade custodian or a multi-sig arrangement with, uh, with a company that you vetted and you trust. But um, leaving, uh, leaving Bitcoin on an exchange has always been risky since Mt. Gox. So we all learned that. Time and time again, it has been proven that there are a lot of risks associated with many of the unregistered and unregulated crypto exchanges. These exchanges represent third parties that are single points of failure susceptible to human errors, cyber attacks, and censorship. There have been a number of brutal hacks that wreck thousands of investors and threaten to take down the market as a whole. Earlier in the year, we saw how the Canadian Prime Minister threatened to seize the crypto assets of truckers protesting the COVID-19 mandates after he had ordered banks to freeze their bank accounts. This proves that most crypto exchanges are just glorified banks that can easily succumb to external pressure. More recently, due to the recent cryptocurrency crash, there have been sad reports of cryptocurrency exchanges facing various liquidity issues. On June 12, the crypto lending firm Celsius paused withdrawals, transfers, and swaps, citing extreme market conditions as reasons for the decision. According to reports, the firm is preparing for possible bankruptcy. CoinFlex, a cryptocurrency exchange, also paused withdrawals on June 23, citing similar reasons as Celsius. In a recent interview, MicroStrategy CEO Michael Saylor speaks extensively about the dangers of crypto exchanges, especially their susceptibility to bankruptcy, hacks, and censorship. The American entrepreneur and businessman also speaks about some of the vulnerabilities that face Bitcoin, as well as his thoughts about the Bitcoin mining sector. Please watch, like, and share this video, and don't forget to drop your comments and observations in the comment section below. Let's dive right in. I think that um, borrowing or, lend or, or generating yield uh, from uh, unregistered uh, or unlicensed bank is or an immature bank is a risky thing to do. And for example, MicroStrategy, we took a loan from Silvergate, but Silvergate was an FDIC insured bank. And when we did that, um, the terms of the loan were such that um, we didn't transfer our Bitcoin to Silvergate Bank. We actually put it in custody and we, main we maintained custody of it. So uh, we could have borrowed money at 0% interest if we had transferred the Bitcoin to one of these wildcat crypto banks, where they would say, they give you a, a very, very cheap loan at a high loan to value, but the catch is you have to transfer your Bitcoin to, to them, and then they loan it out to a third party. The challenge with that is that you take the counterparty risk with the bank. If the bank fails, then you lose your Bitcoin. And then you also take the counterparty risk with uh, the counterparties of the bank that you don't know of. And so if they loan it to someone else, to a hedge fund, like three arrows, and the hedge fund fails, then you also lose your Bitcoin. So you're actually taking two layers of counterparty risk to, uh, to do business with an immature bank. Uh, and uh, it always looks good going in. They pay you a higher interest rate or they give you a cheaper loan. But the counterparty risk, when you calculate it, offsets the benefit. That's why we've never done those things. That's why we never generated yield on Bitcoin. And, and that's why we didn't uh, choose to take on those kind of loans. Uh, so I, I think this is a painful lesson for the industry, but it's not a surprise. I think for the, for the business to grow up, you know, we need more mature, better capitalized institutions, publicly traded companies, uh, public banks, FDIC insured banks, right, uh, licensed registered entities. And of course, uh, when you're, when you're doing business, what you, what you want to do is always be be careful when it looks too good to be true, right? Because when it looks too good to be true, generally it is. In his interview, Saylor also talks about the vulnerabilities facing Bitcoin. As the world's largest cryptocurrency, 
The leading cryptocurrency is often thought of being the same as the general cryptocurrency market. As such, every issue that affects the market brings down Bitcoin's price. We saw that with the Terra implosion in early May, and there is no telling when another project will implode and bring about more negative speculations about Bitcoin. Here is Sailor speaking about some of those vulnerabilities. I think that right now, the biggest vulnerability to Bitcoin is the rest of the crypto industry. I think the 20,000 tokens that are unregistered securities, I think, I think the crypto exchanges, the, the wildcat crypto banks, all the crypto projects, all of the people trading those cryptos, all the crypto hedge funds, and then all of, um, all of the negative publicity and then the negative financial outcomes that come about from, uh, from things like Terra, Luna, right? The, the meltdown of a, of a stable coin that was not stable, uh, that was traded as a commodity that was really a security that because they never declared it a security, they never actually made any fair disclosures on it. So you had an under collateralized asset, $50 billion worth of something trading with a billion or $2 billion of equity, right? 50 X levered without disclosure uh, with uh, a lot of DeFi exchanges and other crypto exchanges, allowing those tokens to trade and marketing them uh, with leverage. And I think that that got cross collateralized into Bitcoin. And so the volatility of Bitcoin on the upside and the downside, and then the, um, the negative publicity and the, the fear that a conventional investor, an institutional investor would have to buy Bitcoin is, uh, is in large part uh, due to uh, the wild west and the wildcatters and the crypto ecosystem. And uh, the sooner that we clear out that leverage and the sooner that the world starts to distinguish between crypto tokens that are securities and then Bitcoin, which is a commodity, then the sooner the industry grows up and the asset class grows up. Michael Saylor also speaks about the issue of solvency with Bitcoin miners as they take some of the biggest hits during a crash like this. In 2018, just a week into a crypto crash, around 800,000 Bitcoin miners had to stop operations due to the crash. Unfortunately, many of these companies run on debt. As a result, if the crash worsens, many of them will go belly up. This is what Michael Saylor has to say on the issue. The elegance of the Bitcoin uh, protocol is that Bitcoin mining is an open uh, permissionless industry that anybody can join. And every two weeks, the difficulty of, uh, of mining increases or decreases based upon the market dynamic. So I, I think of Bitcoin miners as the line of first defense for Bitcoin. When, um, when things go badly, either when, uh, when poor decisions are made or when, uh, when acts of God take place or acts of government or nation states, the miners suffer so that the Bitcoin holders don't. So uh, do I worry about miners? Sure, if you're a miner in Iran running on, on free energy, when the government cracks down on the free energy supplement, you'll suffer. If you're a miner in China running on free or cheap electricity, when the government starts to notice that, you'll suffer. So miners will suffer. Um, when, um, when electricity costs go up, the miners will suffer. When the Bitcoin price goes up, they'll benefit over time. Mining is going to get more difficult. It's going to get 18% more difficult every year because of the halvings. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get 50% more difficult every year because, uh, or 75% more, some percent more because hash rate keeps coming online. And if you're entering the mining business, you're entering into a very, very competitive industry. So that's why I think. Um, it's better if you have money to invest, it's better to invest the money in Bitcoin, not in a Bitcoin mining rig. I think Bitcoin mining is a business and there are counterparty risks. We just, we've seen, for example, 
you know, if you had mining rigs in Russia, when the Russian sanctions took place, you lost your mining rigs. Okay, so if you're in business, you can have your business interest damaged by war, famine, tariff, tax, competition, entropy, you know, poor execution. And that's why, uh, that's why um, mining Bitcoin is not the same as holding Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a very competitive, challenging thing. But if, if uh, miners on the periphery go out of business, if, you know, when half the hash rate got wiped out in China, it didn't damage Bitcoin. It simply shifted the profitability to North America. And if, um, if uh, Bitcoin prices uh, get cut in half and if electricity rates double, it won't wipe out Bitcoin mining. It will simply squeeze out people running mining rigs that are previous to S9. The third, third generation antiquated mining rigs will find their break even point reaches one or two cents a, you know, a kilowatt hour. And if they can't buy electricity cheaper than a penny a kilowatt hour, they're not going to be profitable. So they'll shut down their hash rate. But when they shut down the hash rate, the difficulty will adjust down in order to balance the network. And the network is uh, probably a thousand times uh, higher hash rate than it needs to be to be secure. So I don't, I don't really worry one way or the other about Bitcoin. And as for Bitcoin miners, yeah, if I would worry about every one of them. And, and the reason I don't run a Bitcoin mining company is because it would take all my time and all my attention, and I would be worrying about all of these things. As Saylor has explained in this interview and other interviews, though this is a fairly new industry, it has faced and continues to face its fair share of challenges. However, the network is as solid as it gets, and the community is even more solid. From miners to investors to exchanges and lending firms, every part of this community is going to face these challenges sooner or later. But like all of life's challenges, each one would end and give way to better times. Are you still stacking those sats or whatever cryptocurrency you prefer? Are your dollar costs averaging or just buying those cryptos with all available cash? Please let us know your investment strategy to survive the crypto winter. Also, ensure you drop your comments about Sailor's interview below and don't forget to hit the like button. Thanks for watching.